All right, let's go to the Word of God this morning. I want you to turn with me to the book of John. I'm sorry, Matthew chapter 21. Matthew chapter 21 will also be in the book of John, but I'm going to start in the 21st chapter of the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew chapter number 21. I know you've stood a lot today, but one more time, if you will, just join me in honoring the revealed, revered, and anointed word of Almighty God. Matthew chapter number 21. And I'm going to begin reading in verse 21. We say a special welcome to those watching on live stream. We every week hear from people around the nation that are watching our our live stream. It's amazing how many people that uh, aren't physically able to be here that are able to worship with us. So I thank God for that opportunity. Matthew chapter number 21, beginning in verse number one. If you have it, say amen. The Bible said that when they drew nigh unto Jerusalem and were come to Bethphage unto the Mount of Olives, Then sent Jesus two of his disciples and said, Go to the village over against you, and straightway you're going to find an ass tied at a colt with her. Loose them and bring them to me. And if any man say aught of you, you will say the Lord has need of them, and straightway he's going to send them. All this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king cometh unto you meek and sitting upon an ass and a colt of the fold of an ass. And the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them, and brought the ass and the colt and put them on their clothes, or put, put on them their clothes, and they set him thereon. And a great multitude spread their garments in the ways, and they cut down branches from the trees, and they strawed them in the way. And the multitude that went before him that followed cried and said, Hosanna, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Amen. Come on, just shout Hosanna. Ah, we're going to shout that today. Amen. When he came into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, and they said, Who is this? The multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. And Jesus, he went into the temple of God, and he... Now, this is the part of the the triumphal entry we don't talk about a whole lot, verse 12, but it's part of it. Because as soon as he came down off of that donkey, he went to the temple of God, cast out all them that sold and bought in the temple, overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves. And he said, it's written, my house is called the house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. Amen. I'm preaching this morning simply on this thought, when your praise is not enough. When your praise is not enough. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Amen. It's Palm Sunday. This begins the greatest week in the history of the world. This begins the events that happened in the next seven days that literally transformed the history of the world. You know, I love Christmas, but Christmas is nothing without Easter. Doesn't mean a thing. Unless he is risen from the dead, nothing we do means anything. And that's why this week is such a powerful, powerful week. And I'm excited about all the stuff we'll be celebrating throughout the weekend. But today really kicks it all off. Today is the day that we celebrate the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. As we have just read in Matthew chapter number 21 where they come and they uh, put their clothes, their, their coats and lay them the ground in front of him and they take the branches off of the palm trees and they wave those branches and they cry out, Hosanna, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Man, you talk about a powerful moment when the Son of God is coming off of the Mount of Olives and this fevered pitch gets to a point where their voices are at the highest level and they're crying, Hosanna. Hosanna. But I want to dig deep into this today because the cries of praise soon took a shift that probably nobody expected. Because a few days past this moment in which they were crying out, Hosanna, those same voices suddenly cried out, crucify him. Those same voices that were, now I know I may take a little bit of a different angle than what you were expecting, but I believe Jesus is going to do something in this house today. It's amazing how that crowd, that mob suddenly turned on him within just a few hours and voices that 
deified the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, suddenly demonized him. Isn't it amazing how people can turn on you quickly? Come, anybody had that happen to you in your life? You better be careful when somebody deifies you because that same person will one day demonize you. And the same voices that may compliment you and slather you with praise uh, may turn around and criticize you and condemn you with gossip. It's amazing how some people, they may butter your bread, but then take the butter knife and stab you in the back. It's amazing how that happens. That's why the Bible said charm is deceitful. To charm somebody means simply to say something without really meaning it, whereby to deceive the person to whom it is spoken. So I look at this triumphal entry, and I guess the question is, was this really a triumphal entry? If you were to look at the reaction of the people as Jesus comes riding into the city, you would definitely say, yes, this is a triumphal entry. They lined the streets of the city of Jerusalem, and the enthusiasm of this crowd becomes consuming. It's amazing, the energy that is in the city at this moment. It's Passover. One census at Passover was taken, and they say that during the week of Passover, 256,500 lambs were slain during Passover. Ten people per lamb would estimate that at this moment there was about 2,700,000 people that have packed themselves into the city of Jerusalem. I mean, there's a lot of enthusiasm. There's a lot of excitement. There's a lot of emotion that is running. And, and, and compound that with the, with the fact that politically it was a very hot time in that moment. Politically, the Romans were the oppressor and the tyrannical thumb of Rome was pressing hard on the Jewish people. And how many know when political times get hot, people get emotional? They were emotional and suddenly now they see this individual that is coming down off of the Mount of Olives and they see him riding on a donkey. And they see that this could possibly, this could possibly be the one that Zechariah prophesied about. And we'll get to this, but Zechariah prophesied that the king would come riding on an ass and the foal of an ass would be with him. And so this fevered pitch of emotion, it reaches an all-time high to the point that suddenly they leave what they're doing and they, they begin to line the streets of Jerusalem and they take off their outer coats and they lay them on the ground and they take off the branches of the palm trees and they begin to wave them and they shout Hosanna Hosanna blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord but as you really begin to examine this story and you see what happens in the moments following this outer show of praise you are seeing that these people are lauding him not as a spiritual messiah but rather they are lauding him as a political messiah they are looking at him as one that is going to come and deliver them. And I'm not going to get ahead of myself by saying too much at this moment. Uh, but they were looking to him as one that would be that political king that would deliver. Let me tell you, you better be careful when you place more faith in a political party or candidate than you do the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, come on, somebody. I don't care how smooth he or she is, and I don't care what they may say on the floor of Congress. There is one king, and there is one Lord. His name is Jesus, and politicians are going to disappoint you every time, but the Messiah, the Son of God, will never disappoint you. Come on, somebody shout amen. They were looking at the political spectrum and looking now for a Messiah that would come and not deliver them just spiritually, but they wanted a political king that would come and deliver him. And the reason I know that is because it doesn't take long that when Jesus doesn't do what they think he is going to do, when Jesus does... Now, Let's be, can we just be real? How many know sometimes God doesn't move in the way that you think he's going to move? Hallelujah. 
Sometimes God doesn't answer the prayer in the way that you think he's going to answer it. He doesn't move in the way that you expect him to. And so now, because these people did not see Jesus do what they wanted him to do, now, suddenly now they're not crying out, Hosanna. Now they're crying out, give us Barabbas. Give us a thief. Give us a robber. Give us a notorious criminal. And take this so-called Messiah and nail him to the cross and crucify him. Do away with this Jesus and give us this notorious criminal. You see, their praise on Palm Sunday was not enough because they missed the reason that Jesus had come because in their head, they had it all planned out. But how many know God doesn't always move according to our plans? Come on, somebody. If I read my Bible correctly, I believe the Bible still said his ways are higher than my ways. <laughs> His thoughts are higher than my thoughts. As the heaven is higher than the earth, so higher are his thoughts, so higher are his ways. And today, I'm going to show you through the word of God that Jesus may not always move in the way that you want him to, but he always moves in the way that you need him to. And he's always going to do what is best for your life, and you're going to leave this place with such an anointing of the Holy Ghost in your life, and you're going to leave shouting praise, not because of what he's done, but simply because of who he is, amen. Man. So what happens when you move beyond the crowd that is praising him simply for what he could provide and you move into a worship that is based simply on who he is? And that is the point of my message this morning for the next couple of moments. If you will walk with me through this, through this story and uncover three principles that happens when you begin to worship Jesus simply because of who he is. Number one, you will find that you fully discover the power of his person. You fully discover the power of his person. Look in verse number nine of our text. As I look at these people, they thought that they knew who Jesus was. They went before him, verse 9 says, and they followed and they cried and they said, Hosanna to the son of David. Now, 17 times in the New Testament is Jesus called the son of David. The question people have is, how can he be the son of David? He lives over a thousand years from the time that David walked the face of this earth. How is it that he could be the son of David? David is the first legitimate king of Israel. Saul was an illegitimate king in the fact that he became an apostate and God rejected him. But David was a man after God's own heart and David pro or God promised to David that his reign, his kingdom would be everlasting. And so now the Jewish people looking to David as their first legitimate king are looking now for that individual that is going to sit on the throne of David and set up an everlasting throne. And so as they look at the genealogy of Jesus and you discover this in Matthew chapter 1, you will find his genealogical proof that in his humanity, Jesus was a direct descendant of Abraham and David through Joseph, his legal father. The genealogy of Luke chapter 3 traces Jesus' lineage through his mother, Mary. He is a descendant of David by adoption through Joseph and by blood through Mary. And so now you've got an individual whose genealogical stream goes right back to the first legitimate king of Israel. Add on top of that the fact he is riding into Jerusalem, which satisfies the prophecy given by Zechariah in Zechariah chapter number 9. The prophet said, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just and he has salvation. He is lowly, riding upon an ass and upon a colt the foal of an ass. You see, the problem with these people is, and I want you to understand this plainly, they were so focused on his physical and his national genealogy that they forgot and refused to focus upon his spiritual genealogy. You see, Jesus is not just the son of David. Jesus is the son of Almighty God. Jesus is not just a physical king. He is a spiritual king, amen, that lives throughout all of eternity. And they were so focused upon the national and the physical genealogy that they missed the person of Jesus because they were so focused on what he could provide for them. 
And I want you to hear this next statement because I believe it is crucial for you and I to understand. How many times have we missed the beauty of who Jesus is to us simply because we are so focused on what Jesus can do for us? How many times have we missed the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ in our time of prayer because we get on our knees and the entire time we are begging him to move on our behalf. God, I need this in my home. Lord, I need this in my family. Lord, I need you to take my boss out because he's driving me crazy. We spend the entire time focused only on what Jesus can do for us, that we miss the beauty of what he means to us. And my point this morning is, my friend, I believe God wants the church to get beyond this shallow level of praise where we are just thanking God for the money that's in our bank account and thanking God for the food that is on our table and thanking God for the car that's in our garage. And we get into a level of worship uh, where we lift our hands uh, and we just simply say, Jesus, uh, I'm going to worship you not for what you've done. I'm going to worship you simply uh, because of who you are. Hallelujah. Oh, let me tell you, uh, if God never did another thing for you, uh, how many believe he's still worthy of our praise? If he never answered another prayer for you, he is still worthy of our praise. If he never moved in your behalf, he's still worthy of our worship. You know why? Because he is God. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is the everlasting God and the everlasting Father. My God, he's worthy of our worship simply because of who he is. Amen. Hallelujah. There's somebody here today. God hasn't moved the way you thought that he would move. I know that because I prayed over you. I feel this in my spirit. God has not moved in the way that you thought he was going to move. You prayed. You thought God was going to move in a direction. But God took a detour and didn't do what you thought he was going to do. And you're left saying, God, why? Why? Why is my child still not saved? Why am I still not healed? Why do I still not have the financial security that I've been asking you for? Why is it uh, that you have not moved? And what the devil does is he comes in like a liar that he is, uh, and he slips doubt into your mind, and he tries to convince you, see, if God loved you, he would have answered your prayer. He tries to tell you that if God really loved you, he would have done what you asked him to do and moved the way that you wanted him to move. And now suddenly you've got doubt in your mind. You've got fear in your heart. What if God doesn't really love me? And all of a sudden now you don't want to pray anymore because God hasn't moved the way you wanted him to move. You don't want to read the Bible anymore because if he didn't move the first time, why should I trust him the second time? Oh, come on, somebody. Can I just be real with you today. I know the devices of the devil. He is a stinking liar and he's defeated damn to hell. But I'm telling you this morning, that lie is very real. And so many people, they buy into that doubt and they buy into that lie that if Jesus doesn't move and do what I want him to do, somehow I have missed it. Amen. Let me tell you, friend, don't let the devil convince you otherwise because Jesus is on the throne whether he moves the way you want him to or not, he is still God. He always will be God. And because he is God, he is worthy of my praise. And I'm going to lift my hands. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'm not going to fear any evil. Why? Because thou art with me. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So many times, you see, the dilemma that the human race perpetually finds itself in, we tend to worship Jesus for what he can do for us and not simply for who he is. You know why I came to church this morning? Not to preach the word of God. I came to worship the son of God. 
Preaching the word is just part of my worship. That's just part of my praise. Amen. I love you, but I didn't come to see you. I came to see Jesus glorified in this house. Ah, I want to see the church full. You know what the problem is in the church today is we got a bunch of people that are living on a shallow level of praise. And then when God doesn't move or God doesn't provide or things go wrong or we lose our job or we lose our spouse, suddenly our faith is derailed and we are off the tracks. Let me tell you, friend, he or she can walk out on you, but Jesus said, I am with you even to the end of the world. And you can worship him this Despite what is, oh, come on somebody, somebody's got to give him a shout of praise. You're in the darkest moment of your life. You are in the valley that you never thought you'd get out of. You are fighting for your life, but on Palm Sunday, you are going to shout of praise under the Messiah, the Son of Almighty God, and you are going to tap into who he is. Amen. He's still the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He's still the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. He's still he which was, which is, and which is to come. He's still the light of the world. You're never going to be lost in darkness. He's the light of the world. He's still the bread of life. You're never going to go hungry. He's still the fountain of living water. You're never going to go thirsty. He is still the king that sits on the right hand of the throne of God. I don't care what happens in this world. I don't care who occupies the White House. I know who occupies pies the throne of heaven. His name is Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Somebody give him a shout of praise right now. Give him a shout of praise right now. Hallelujah, Jesus. Oh, Lord, you're worthy of our praise. You're worthy of our praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Man, what would happen on a Sunday morning if 800 people walked into this house not worried about what happened last week on the job but came with one reason and that is to stretch their hands and shout Hosanna, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of, the, I'm telling you what would happen. We would see Jesus come into this house and heal the sick and deliver the oppressed and save the lost. Why? Because we are looking to him as our Messiah. And when you worship him for his person, you will never lack his provision. Ever. How many receive that right now? Come on, shout amen. amen. Hallelujah. Not only do you fully discover the power of his person, but secondly, you fully discover the power of his plan. Look in verse 2. Now, Jesus has just left the house of Lazarus, Mary and Martha. Mary has anointed him with that extravagant oil wiped his feet with her hair. And then he says, go to the village over against and straightway you're going to find an ass tied in a colt with her. Loose them and bring them to me. And if any man say aught unto you, ye shall say the Lord hath need of them. And straightway he will send them. Wouldn't you like to do that to somebody's Lexus? God said, I need your Lexus. No, I'm just kidding. Don't try that. Pastor told me to come use your car today. Jesus said, the Lord hath need of And they loosed him. And all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet and said, tell the daughter of Zion, behold, the king cometh. Meek, sitting upon an ass in the cold of the fold of an ass. Now, the fact that Jesus rides into Jerusalem on a donkey is extremely significant. Why would the creator of the universe ride on the back of a donkey into Jerusalem? You'd think he'd be riding on a white horse. Some animal used in military conquest, but he chooses the lowliest and the most stubborn of animals. Look at your neighbor and say, there's still hope for you. Oh, come on, lighten up a little bit. You know you're stubborn. 
That's really good for husbands and wives to tell each other. He uses the lowliest and the most stubborn of animals to ride into Jerusalem, making this triumphant entry. And of course, the reason is simple. First of all, to fulfill prophecy, the prophecy of Zechariah that I've already read to you out of the ninth chapter, that he would be riding in on an ass in the cold of the fold of an ass. You see, Jesus knew the Old Testament scripture. I love it that Jesus fulfilled absolutely every single prophecy that was given about him in the Old Testament. Amen. You know why I love that? Because that means everything in this book. He's My Bible is coming apart. I guess that's better than me coming apart, right? That means everything that's in this book right now, how many believe it's been prophesied and it will be promised and it will come to pass for you today? Somebody shout amen. He fulfills every prophecy, every word that has been spoken and that has been written. And so it's because of that prophecy that now these people, they come and they say, Hosanna. Now, lest you think that this is an endearing term of worship, the word Hosanna literally means save now. Save now. This was a political cry. Save us right now. Deliver us right now. Now, we are tired of living under this Roman oppression. We want you to save us right here. We want you to deliver us right now. We acknowledge you as our king, but we acknowledge that you are our political king that is coming to deliver us out of the tyranny of Rome. And that's why they spread palm branches, because palm branches, as they wave them, that is a symbol of victory. That is the symbol of a victorious king. When you look in the book of Revelation, chapter number 7 and verse number 9, the Bible said, John said, I behold, and there was a great multitude which no man could number of all nations, kindreds, people, tongues, and they stood before the throne and before the lamb and they were clothed with white robes and palms in their hand and so palms are sometimes used to reflect joy and beauty so when you put all of this together strength salvation joy beauty you get the proclamation they make as they are waving the palm branches they can almost hear taste that sweet sweet savor of victory They could almost see themselves sitting on the throne with Jesus, their Messiah. Amen. This was the day now that the Jews would take over. Amen. This is the day the Jews would rule and the Romans would drool. I mean, they were excited. They were ready to give a black eye. Amen. To the Roman emperor and to the military of Rome. And that's why they did this. They thought he's come to deliver them. Even the closest followers of Jesus, they felt this way. Look in John Chapter number 12, verse number 16, the Bible said these things, even the disciples, they didn't understand at first. They were even arguing who was going to sit at his right hand and who was the greatest among them. But you see, and I want you to get this understanding, Jesus didn't come just to deliver the Jews from the Romans. He came to deliver the world from the devil. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. He didn't come only to deliver a nation. He came to deliver every tribe, every tongue, and every nation. He didn't come just to be the Messiah of Israel and the Jews. He came to be the Messiah of every Gentile that walked the four corners of the earth. You see, they were looking for a deliverance that was right now. But I'm telling you, Jesus came to deliver every single person from the spider web and the bondage of sin. He came to deliver every person out of the addiction and the prison cells of drugs, alcohol, whatever addiction may be in your heart and your mind. Jesus came not to deliver a a political kingdom, but rather he came to set you free from the very confines of your heart. What am I telling you, church? We are serving today a Messiah that came to set every single man and woman completely free. It is not the will of God for you to be bound any longer, but for you to be free in Jesus' name. Somebody shout amen. Hallelujah. (laughs) And he who the Son sets free. Come on, somebody, shout it out loud. (laughs) 
I want to grab my Bible, but I want to lose it. He didn't come to deliver like the world delivers. Oh, come on, somebody. The world had this idea that he's going to deliver them at that moment. But you see, Jesus didn't come to deliver like the world delivers. Because you see what the world does, uh, if you want to be set free, here's, here's a bottle of pills that I'm going to give to you. You just take these pills and you're, you're going to feel better. Or maybe you need to go into this program. Or maybe you need to do this. Uh, oh, no, 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 no. When Jesus sets you free, uh, he sets you free from the inside out. Uh, and brother, there is nobody uh, that can ever take that freedom from you. And I am sick uh, of the devil trying to convince the church uh, that we live uh, under a spirit of bondage. That's a lie out of hell. We are free in Jesus' name, and we ought to shout in freedom and liberty because my freedom is everlasting. Somebody shout amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I know I might be a bit emotional today, but I'm serving a Savior that instantaneously can break the prison bars of whatever addiction is out there, and you can stand, and you can know that I am free, and I will worship him. Well, listen, listen, listen. When you begin to worship Jesus for who he is, there is an anointing of deliverance. I'm telling you, there's an anointing of deliverance in this place right here and right now. When you come and you lift up your hands, I don't care if last night you were strung out on drugs. God can sober you up. If you are right with God and you get it under the blood and you begin to tap into the power of the Lord Jesus Christ, I'm telling you there is an instantaneous power that breaks every chain. And we need to preach the message of deliverance again. Amen. Hallelujah. Whatever happened to just preaching about the spirit of deliverance? Instead of preaching a bunch of new age philosophy of personal de development and to this, and how about we just begin to worship Jesus for who he is, cut through all the trash of this new age philosophy that has gotten behind the pulpits of churches because we're so afraid to offend people and we don't want to make them mad, so we just pat them on the back and say it's going to be okay. No, listen, Jesus can deliver every homosexual, every lesbian. He can deliver every drug addict. He can take a transgender, put them back where God wanted them to be in the first place he can do it why because he's Jesus that's why because he's the son of God that's why because all power in heaven and earth is given unto him that's why it doesn't take anybody else it takes the power of the Lord Jesus Christ amen hallelujah somebody just give him 30 seconds of praise right now Oh, hallelujah, Jesus. Glory to God. Glory to God. His plan is for you to be free today. That's his plan. Don't tell me otherwise, because I don't believe it. And that comes to worship. Second Chronicles 20. Ammonites and the Moabites had come against Jehoshaphat, had come against the Israelites. Outnumbered, overwhelmed, Jehoshaphat goes to the Lord in prayer. God tells him in verse 17, he said, you don't need to fight in this battle. Let me ride my hobby horse just a minute. Listen, I, I don't, don't misconstrue what I'm saying. But if all you do is talk about how, how down you are because of your battles, something's wrong. I said, something's wrong. 
We all fight battles. How many know that? Come on. We all fight battles. But if, if all you do is talk about your battle, you're missing something. I've told you before, some people, man, I don't want to ask how they are. Because they'll tell me. And I got about 30 minutes of listening to this battle after this battle after this battle. Devil's been beating me up, glory to his name, and all that kind of... We all fight battles, but God told Jehoshaphat, he said, you don't need to fight in this battle. <laughs> Look at your neighbor and say, you don't need to fight this battle. You know why? He said, you need to just simply stand still and see the salvation of the Lord that is with you. Oh, Judah. <laughs> Ooh, this is a promise for somebody right now. Oh, whatever your name is. Oh, Judah. Fear not, nor be dismayed, because tomorrow you're going to go out against them, and the Lord is going to be with you. This is a prophetic word for somebody. You're in, you're, you're in the battle right now, and I'm telling you right now, you don't need to fight this battle, but you need to stand still. And then tomorrow morning when you get up, you need to do what Jehoshaphat said. Do you know what Jehoshaphat did? Most unconventional, most untraditional, and weirdest way to fight a battle. Verse 20, 21, when he had consulted with the people, he appointed singers unto the Lord. Are you, are you catching this? He appointed singers unto the Lord and, 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 and that they should praise the beauty of his holiness. And they went out before the army. And they said, praise the Lord, for his mercy endureth forever. And when they began to sing and to praise, the Lord sent ambushments against the children of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir, which were come against Judah. And guess what? They were smitten. Jehoshaphat said, okay, where's my worshipers? Where's my singers? Where's my praisers? Amen. Where's the people that know how to shout? He said, I want them going first. He said, I'm going to put that. I'm not going to put the big buff artillery guys like Dwayne the Rock Johnson on the front line. He said, I want some singers on that front line. He said, I want some praisers on that front line. And they went out and they began to sing. And suddenly the Moabites and the Ammonites, they got all confused because out of nowhere, there was an ambushment that was a divine order of Almighty God and he slew the Ammonites, and he slew the Moabites without Israel lifting a sword. You know why? Because they began to worship. And when you begin to worship, all of a sudden, my God fights your battle. And out of nowhere, there is a divine ambushment that comes and slays your enemy and takes them out. Woo! My God, I wish somebody heard what I'm about to say. Tomorrow morning, tomorrow morning when you get up, you don't get up. Oh, me, here we go again. Get ready for the devil to attack me again. Oh, it's Monday morning. No, you get up. You put your feet on the ground and you get your hands in the air and you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. You begin to worship the Lord. You begin to praise him. Go ahead and sing. Go ahead and shout. I don't care if you can't sing. Sing anyway. God knows your heart. And when you do that, all of a sudden, the ambushments of heaven are going to come and take out that depression, it's going to go in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Somebody's going to win a battle because you chose to worship him. Where's my singers? Where's my singers? Oh, somebody's going to win a battle because you chose to worship him. <laughs> oh, Jesus is in the house and he's worthy of our praise. I said, oh, my God, my Lord and my God, you need to lift up your hands. You need to lift up your voice. You're fighting a battle. You need to get down to this altar. You need to get down to this altar. Come on, right now.